Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. Today we're talking about the communist attitude towards religion, towards religion as an ideological system, but also how communists would deal with religion as a matter of policy, were we to win power, how we relate to religious workers, and how we tackle these ideas in the movement and to help us delve into this topic, we have Jack Halinsky Fitzpatrick, who is a leading member of the International Marxist Tendency and writes for Marxist.com. Jack, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So, first question, because this is a little different to the kind of thing we've been discussing on previous episodes, why are we talking about religion? Why does it matter that Marxists, the communists, have a clear line, have a clear view towards religion and religious belief? Yeah, thank you, Joe. I mean, I think that's a very good question to start with. As you say, we, we are communists, right? And so communists want communism. Surprise, surprise. And so I how, hear. <laughs> how, how are we going to achieve this? Well, in order to achieve communism, really what we need is a revolution, which involves the broad mass of the working class in a struggle to overthrow capitalism. But... Obviously, in order to do that, we need to win over the working class, right? Um, but the point is, we can't ignore this. It's a it's a fact that you know huge numbers of the working class are religious. Uh, I found some statistics, for example. So the recent census from the United Kingdom found that sixty three percent of people have some sort of religion in the United Kingdom. You also have, uh, there was a Gallup poll as well that said 75% of American uh, people report praying, sometimes or very often. So, you know, we do need to take account of religion uh, if we are to win these working class people over to our program. Mm. And it's interesting, isn't it? There's a contradiction in the modern world in the year of our Lord, 2023, You've got such an advanced civilization. You can do so many things that would have seemed like witchcraft 100, 200 years ago. We can send people to space. We can edit our genes. We can cure diseases that used to kill millions every year. And yet, despite all this technology and despite all these amazing advancements, Bronze Age philosophies, or even older, continue to have a grip on the minds of, as you say, um, perhaps the majority of people around the world. Why is it that religion still has such an important influence today? Why does religion even exist today in a world that in many ways is so scientifically advanced? Well, yeah, um, thanks for that, Joe. I think that is a big contradiction, right? And it has led, I would say, some people to take a very strange uh, approach to dealing with this question. Uh, when when you were speaking, I, I started thinking of uh, of a man named Richard Dawkins, for example, mm. who, again, he is uh, he was a scientist by background, and he he basically points to all of the um, quite you know. <laughs> quite, uh, you know, the amazing wonders that science, uh, human progress has uh, has achieved. And he says, yeah, he deals with this question, why on earth are there religious people? But his explanation, and he kind of represents a bit of a trend. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I used to be a bit of a fan of uh, Richard Dawkins and the New Atheist <laughs> Movement for my sins <laughs> in, my, in my adolescence. Oh dear. Okay. No, I think uh, I'm okay. sure I, many I, of us have been. There. I've overcome that particular case of measles. Don't worry. <laughs> That's very good. Well, he's. I looked him up. He's he's eighty uh, odd now, so he still hasn't overcome um, this uh, this case of measles. But anyway, his his main argument is that yeah, well, the reason why religious uh, ideas exist. Uh, today in in society is basically just because of ignorance. You know, working class people are stupid, but luckily enough, Richard Dawkins has come along to educate everyone, um, and he will, you know, he will eradicate religion by going on talk shows yeah. and uh, things I, like that. I, I remember he gave a big speech to uh, a sort of mini festival, some sort of, I don't know, rationalist atheist festival. 
and he was saying, if you encounter religious people, people who believe in talking snakes and virgin births, you have to ridicule them. You have to belittle and ridicule their beliefs, and only then will they learn to overcome them. Yeah, I mean, I think... <laughs> Hearing that, it's time to ridicule Richard Dawkins, to be honest, because I think his his approach is a completely stupid and completely arrogant approach, really. And counterproductive. Um, well, yes, exactly, exactly. I think I can't think of anything that would push people further into those sorts of beliefs than um, ridiculing them, as uh, as Mr. Dawkins suggests. Um, but no, yeah, um, Mar Marxists do have uh, an, uh, an explanation as to why we believe this, uh, this contradiction exists. Um, and yeah, we would say that um, it's kind of a twofold reason really for religion existing today. I just want to go into, I mean, I'm sure many people who are listening to this uh, podcast at the moment have heard the famous uh, Marxist quote um, that religion is the opium of the people. Yep. Um, From but, the preface to the unpublished huh. critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. Yes, no, exactly. Um, but whilst people maybe have heard that snippet of the quotes. I'm sure many people actually haven't heard the full quote, and mm -hmm. I, I would like to quote it. Please, it's uh, one of my favourites. Yeah, it's, it's excellent. So Marx says, Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, just as it is the spirit of spiritless conditions. It is the opium of the people. So you can see there's a much fuller <laughs> content yeah. to that quote than if you just take the, the little snippet. And mm. What What is Marx getting at here? Well, I think what, what he's saying is that we live in a world that's full of poverty, oppression, suffering, misery, basically. Um, and so given all of this, which is not explained, you know, it seems like a mystery that uh, all of these wars and the suffering exists. People want, people need some sort of comfort, basically. Um, and that's what religion provides. You know, it, it, it might be the case that you're suffering today or that your life is terrible, but at least you know, <laughs> or you think you know, that after you die, you'll end up in some sort of, you know, heavenly uh, bliss, basically. So religion answers a very real need that humans have in, in class society, basically. Yeah, and later on, an even less known part of that text by Marx is where he says that the purpose of materialist criticism is to pluck the imaginary flowers from the chain of oppression. That's how he characterizes religion, this imaginary adornment that makes human beings capable of enduring the injustices and the miseries of exploitation and oppression. And he goes on to say that the purpose of that is not so that man shall continue to bear the chain without consolation, but that he might cast it off and pluck the living real flower. And I think that is really what gets to the heart of the matter from a Marxist point of view. And we'll get into this. Yes, we criticize religion, but we do so not to just rob people of the little comfort they get from their religious beliefs, but that they might find genuine consolation in the real world. Yes, uh, no, exactly. Um, I think uh, I, I saw recently that there was um, a Gallup poll that c was conducted that actually um, it correlated, uh, you know, countries that suffer the highest amount of poverty tend mm. to be uh, those that are most religious. Mm. Um, I was also thinking when you were speaking, it reminded me of, um, I think it was Alan Woods who makes this uh, analogy. Um, in, uh, in one of his texts where he basically uh, investigates the earliest forms of religion, mm. which were animist uh, religions, which um, so animist religions basically um, attribute to uh, inanimate objects or natural processes. They, they imagine uh, these, uh, these things to have souls. Yeah. So, you know, for example, uh, the early humans might hear, you know, thunder in the sky sort mm. of thing, have no idea where this was coming from. Um, and in order to explain this unexplainable uh, phenomena, they would then attribute it to some sort of god that yeah. lives in the sky. Yeah, it still exists in, to a certain extent in some very ancient religious or cultural traditions like Shinto in Japan, for example. Um, you have kami, which are exactly that. They're the spirits that inhabit 
everything rocks rivers yeah. no and i mean i guess why is that happening right well it's like these people um or, or what's the origin i suppose of those of that um uh, attempt to explain things where it's an attempt to explain things without understanding why these things truly are happening. There is an analogy to religion today because people see uh, massive unemployment. They see, uh, you know, the price of their energy going through the roof overnight. Um, they see, you know, immense uh, poverty by side by side with uh, immense riches and everything. And all of this is happening and they have no idea why it is happening. Um, and so it is a it's a resort, basically, to some sort of supernatural uh, explanation, basically, for these things that um, are happening that people have no uh, control, really, or understanding of. Yes. And this consoling effect that religion provides is also why it's exploited by the ruling elite and always has been um, the philosopher Seneca famously said in ancient Rome that religion is regarded by the common people as true, by the wise as false, and by the rulers as useful. So can we talk about the way in which religion is exploited by the ruling class, by the state, by the powers that be in order to enforce their will? Yeah, um, no, thanks for that, Joe. I think that's a really <laughs> perceptive quote um, there that you gave. A very honest one from a, <laughs> a patrician figure who get away with it. Well, exactly. No, he seemed to know what he was talking about anyway. <laughs> but um, no, because look, what what all class societies, what, what are they ultimately? Well, they're ruled by a tiny minority over the vast majority of the population. Um, you know, you, you just think of uh, the capitalist society today. You have immense amounts of wealth and power and privileges that are held by a tiny, tiny proportion uh, mm. of the population. Yeah. Well, they can't maintain that status quo purely by force, right? Mm. Uh, that would be impossible. So they need to rely on uh, ideas as well in order to uh, maintain this uh, this system. And one of the most important ideas is religion. That's mm. why you see, uh, you know, every class, uh, ruling class in history has relied on religion uh, to, to solidify um, their, their rule. To sneak in another quote by perhaps an even more profound philosopher than Seneca, Matthew McConaughey, in the first season of True Detective, uh, his character has, has renounced religion, at least at the beginning, and he's asked why, and he said, because religion started when one monkey pointed at the sun and said to the other monkey, he says that I deserve your share. We've got the, the height of human thoughts. Is <laughs> yeah, we, we, try, we try to encompass a broad spectrum of thinkers on this show. <laughs> um, but no, look, uh, I think both, both of these philosophers were, were, uh, were right. Because, um, you know, look, if you're able to convince people um, that, yeah, you know, your life might not be ideal at the moment. And uh, yeah, look, there's there's some rich people, there's some poor people. But if you just behave, if you just live a meek life, uh, obey these rules in this book for the for the the course of your life. Well, after you die, mm. there'll be a there'll be a, a you know <laughs> wondrous uh, yeah. heaven uh, waiting for you. And most importantly, in the meantime, the suffering and the inequality and the lowly position you occupy is all part of the plan. <laughs> yes, no, precisely. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to give one small example um, to, if we've got time, to illustrate this uh, process because I think it is very. Um, I think it demonstrates it well, basically. Um, and that's the, the, the French Revolution. Because the, the French Revolution was fought, really, under the banner of reason. You know, every, uh, every idea, every party, every tendency, everything had to be justified under, you know, in the court of reason, so to speak, right? And if, uh, if they failed this test, then they deserve to be overthrown. So what you see then is that uh, the under the Jacobin state, for example, this was a, an officially atheist state. Mm -hmm. Religion also more or less uh, disappeared in the country following the revolution itself. But what was the result of this revolution? Well, it, it didn't bring about liberty, equality and fraternity, really. What it brought about was the rule, again, of a new ruling class, this time the, the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class. So 
therefore you have a new ruling class, again, you know, a, a minority in society, rediscovering, basically, the utility of religion. And so you have, especially towards the end of the 19th century, you have this new ruling class basically, uh, you know, re-campaigning re for religion. You have the invention of various uh, miracles. Um, so yeah, the, the French bourgeoisie basically rediscovered religion in order to defend its newfound uh, wealth and privileges. Mm. I suppose the comparison is even more dramatic if you look at the American Revolution, which, okay, it was made in religious tones in some instances, but ultimately the founding fathers were secularists and it was uh, another uh, revolution, a bourgeois revolution against feudalism and religious obscurantism and against the rule of the crown in England. Um, but look at the state of the American bourgeoisie today. I mean, they ordained the most horrendous crimes of imperialism uh, under God's will. They anoint... Um, the destruction of entire countries with holy oil. They're always talking about God. They're always talking about religion. They completely wrap themselves in the cloak of, stup of superstition. Well, yes, exactly. That's another very good example. And I think, you know, if you have the same process happening in very different <laughs> times, in very different uh, places, happening time and time and time again, I think you have to begin to conclude that there is some sort of law uh, behind this, really. And so I, I would say this is very good proof for the fact that religion uh, does play this role uh, for the ruling class. It plays a very <laughs> useful role of uh, defending their power and privileges. There's one little anecdote. Obviously, the American religious right is a monstrously reactionary, extremely wealthy and very powerful force in American society. It's pushed for attacks on women's reproductive rights. It tends to line up with the ruling class when it comes to imperialist adventures and attacking migrants and so on. And there was one guy, this televangelist, multimillionaire, of course, who told his flock that he needed their donations in order to pay for a private jet because it was only when he was very high in the sky by himself that he could commune with God, which uh, really just exposes the complete cynicism of these people. Um, oh, very nice for him. Yeah, very nice for him indeed. Uh, very generous of his, uh, of his flock. But uh, having said all this, um, and... We'll get into the weeds of the Marxist conception of the world, about our philosophy later on, but suffice it to say, Marxists and communists, our philosophy is atheistic, explicitly so. Dialectical materialism is an atheist philosophy. We recognise the reactionary role that religion plays in society and the counter-revolutionary role it plays when revolutionary movements break out, but is it therefore impossible to be religious? and also to be a Marxist or a communist? Yeah, no, thanks for that, Joe. I think it's a very important question. And um, <laughs> often, uh, I think people probably are aware that <laughs> there are straw, ma uh, straw men are often built up in order to attack Marxism. Um, and so I think Marxists are not one-sided uh, creatures, and I think it's important, actually, to take an all-sided view of religion. Because actually, many of the uh, major religions, when they first emerged, had a totally different character mm. um, to, you know, that they have today. I just want to talk really, at the moment, for, for lack of time, just of Christianity. Sure. Because maybe people who are listening to this aren't aware, but when Christianity first emerged, it was actually, you know, <laughs> a revolutionary movement. It was a movement of the uh, oppressed, of the exploited, um, of the slaves, uh, basically. Yeah, the religion of slaves and women, it was known as by the ruling elite of Roman society. Exactly, exactly. And, um, you know, the, the early Christians, really, um, they, they were revolutionaries, yeah. um, struggling against the Roman Empire. I just want to give one quote, mm -hmm. um, if we've got time. Of course. It's from the Epistle of St. James. Uh, and it's uh, quite hair-raising stuff, really, if you're used to the sort of <laughs> sanctified uh, atmosphere of the church. But anyway, it goes, Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. 
Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the labourers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you, kept back by fraud. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth, and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. <laughs> oh, I've chills. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's almost a shame that you're uh, an atheist communist, Jack. You would have made a fantastic radical preacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if it, that was a compliment, but anyway. <laughs> but I, I think, I mean, this is, yeah, it is a, it's an amazing quote, really. And it, it, it's filled with revolutionary class hatred, of really. Course, yeah. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, it's not only that, it's not only um, these isolated quotes, but th th in practice, they were um, a kind of, uh, like, they advocated a form of primitive communism, basically. Mm. The um, members of the church had to renounce all of their wealth. <laughs> um, it was a collective, um, like, uh, struggle against the status quo, basically. Yeah. Well, well it, it was the religion of an occupied people. I mean, the early Christians were essentially a militant Jewish sect originating out of occupied Roman occupied Judea exactly exactly um, now maybe we don't have enough time to go into the full details of this um, but obviously Christianity hasn't um, isn't still um, a, a revolutionary um, ideology mm. um, because you know eventually um, you had uh, one of the emperors of Rome uh, Constantine made this same conclusion we've been speaking about, um, you know, earlier in the podcast, in that he uh, wanted some sort of um, ideological backing uh, and also the kind of physical backing of the, of the, of the uh, structures of the church in order to justify his um, or secure his rule, basically. And so gradually you did have a, a corruption of the kind of upper layers of the Christian church, and it's become <laughs> eventually what we, uh, what we see today. But of course we're talking about revolutionaries, radicals, the angry and oppressed poor, but what about communists? Can you be a communist or a Marxist and also be religious? Has it ever happened that people have uh, sung from those two hymn sheets? Yes, well, yeah, I mean, the thing is, obviously, the the church exists in society, right? And so it, it comes under the pressure of society as well. So you've had examples of, um, you know, the kind of lower ranks of the of the of the clergy, for example, mm. who have been influenced by the uh, poverty suffering of the people who come to their churches. Yeah, there's two churches, as Alan's fond of saying. <laughs> Yes, no, no, exactly. I mean, I found a very good uh, quote um, from a former Colombian priest, actually, uh, called Camillo Torres. Um, and he actually said, I have cast off the priest's habit in order to become a real priest. It is the duty of every Catholic to be a revolutionary. It is the duty of every revolutionary to carry out the revolution. The Catholic who is not a revolutionary is living in mortal sin. This was a priest, again, who became uh, influenced by the kind of the people who were coming to his church and yeah. concluded, really, that the best way to help people was to fight against the status quo. Yeah, one of the most famous exponents of so-called liberation theology. Yes, no, no, exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, we don't want to go completely on uh, on one side, right? Because whilst there are these examples... Um, organized religion as it is today, really, I do think we have to be honest about this, is a reactionary force. Yes. Um, there's plenty of examples of this. I just want to focus uh, on the Catholic Church. I mean, the Catholic Church um, has, for example, in the 1930s, the Catholic bishops uh, blessed the armies of Franco. Um, Pope Pius uh, XII as well backed both Hitler and Mussolini, remained silent as well about the concentration camps. Um, you also have to ask, you know, what influences the position that the church takes? Well, um, the, the churches, <laughs> whichever one you're talking about, really, have huge financial interests in maintaining the status quo. Mm. Just, I mean, we're, we're speaking from Britain uh, today, Joe. The, the Church of England is one of the uh, biggest landowners in Britain. 
that's why it's uh, you know you can't have the the church will never um, as you know as an institution come over to the side uh, of revolution. It will always play uh, a reactionary role. To mark 100 years since the death of Lenin, the great Marxist revolutionary and leader of the October Revolution, our international is launching a brand new biography, In Defense of Lenin, written by Rob Sewell and Alan Woods. The book traces Lenin's life and works and explains his real ideas, defending his colossal heritage against over a century of capitalist myths and slanders. Pre-order your copy at wellreadbooks.com. That's wellread-books.com. So we've been discussing the role of religion, the reactionary role of religious institutions, but just to deal in a bit more depth with this question of philosophy, because Engels famously said that the class struggle is fought on three fronts, the economic, the political, and the ideological, and the latter is at least as important as the first two. Why is it that it's important that Marxists understand their own philosophical outlook, that we differentiate that philosophical outlook from a religious one? Why is it that Marxists defend and educate themselves in dialectical materialism. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Joe. Um, and yeah, I think it's a very important question. And sometimes people can um, disregard the, the philosophical struggle. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the class struggle. Why do I need to bother with philosophy or with ideas or things like this? But, you know, we should ask ourselves, well, what, what, what are we fighting for here? We're fighting mm. for a society where um, the needs of everyone uh, is met for a totally different society that, uh, where there is no ruling class, uh, basically. But I think history has shown that no ruling class ever has given up its power and privileges without a fight. And so it will be necessary to conduct a struggle, basically. To uh, it's uh, it's called the class war <laughs> for a reason, right? Um, but what? How how are wars fought? Uh, really, you know, how how does the ruling class fight its wars? Well, it doesn't just um, you know go into it uh, you know without thinking. Well, the an army, a, a bourgeois army, is led by officers. It's led by generals. It's led by people who have studied the history of war, um, derived certain principles, certain ideas from that. Um, they conduct their struggle not uh, just at random. <laughs> they conduct their struggle based on um, the combined history of the study of the art of war. And I think that's, you know, <laughs> something similar for us. We need to base um, our, our struggle not just, um, you know, just having a go, <laughs> we need to base our struggle on on something. And I'd say that the the thing that we need to base ourselves on is uh, is the most revolutionary, um, the uh, the the highest level of uh, philosophical thoughts that humanity uh, has come to so far, which is uh, the the method of Marxism, so dialectical materialism. Um, now, uh, I've been informed by you before that we began speaking that there's going to be a whole podcast on dialectical materialism. Perhaps more than one. Well, I know there's there, there was a whole podcast series on uh, dialectical materialism done by uh, Socialist Appeal a couple of years ago, I think. So I'm going to have to be somewhat uh, telegraphic when I go um, through this. But... Um, why do we advocate, or why do we think that dialectical materialism is so necessary? Well, let's take them one by one. I mean, materialism, what is it? Well, it's the idea that what is primary in the world? What's primary is matter. Um, and what does that mean? Well, it means our thoughts, our perceptions are really just uh, reflections of matter. And matter, reality exists, it has its own existence separate and apart from um, our own perception of it. Obviously, that, um, <laughs> that by its very nature means that we are atheists, right? Uh, religion is, uh, is an idealist philosophy whereby, uh, you know, everything that exists really is the product of some sort of uh, God, basically. Right. And all idealism ultimately flows back to God, because if you believe that something exists outside of matter, then it can only really have one source, which is the big man upstairs in some form or another. 
Yes, yes, no, exactly. And uh, what what that really tends to lend to uh, towards is quite a, a static uh, view of um, of of reality. Mm. Um, this uh, this man, Pope Pius the Twelfth, for example, gave a very good uh, demonstration of it, where he said, um, "The multiplicity of classes corresponds fully to the designs of the Creator." Right. So what does that mean? Well, look, <laughs> there's no point struggling uh, against the uh, existence of extremely wealthy people on one side and uh, the vast majority of people living, uh, uh, you know, barely scraping by because it's <laughs> all preordained. There's no that's just how how it is, basically. Um, so idealism, there is an inherent conservatism, basically, to uh, it. Um but on the other hand as well, we would say, you know, we need a, a, a dialectical approach. Uh, what is dialectics? What's well, the idea that, you know, this matter that exists is in a, con a process of constant uh, change, essentially. Um, now, obviously, this could seem a little bit abstract. I would recommend people go and listen to this forthcoming uh, or this episode on, uh, on philosophy. But I want to give one just concrete example of it. Um, so I had a, a comrade um, who um, was in one of my uh, branches once, um, and he said that he was a trade union organiser in his workplace. And he was known in the workplace as being the communist. And his his colleagues were, you know, not really listening to him <laughs> in uh, from a political point of view. Um, they they were friendly towards him, but they didn't look to him for political guidance. Equally, you know, there might have been some semi-reactionary ideas amongst some of his colleagues, some sexist, some racist uh, ideas occasionally. Um, and so if he didn't have a dialectical materialist approach, he might then get trapped in the level of consciousness at that particular time. He might then have, you know, begun bending his politics to the the state of consciousness at that particular time amongst those particular people but he didn't he maintained his uh, his communist approach obviously uh, he he put his communist ideas in a way that could be understood by uh, his fellow colleagues and then what that meant was that when a strike took off and the existing leadership was shown to be inept the existing right wing leadership the the his colleagues didn't slowly and steadily move um move you know in a leftward direction they radically and rapidly changed there was a a revolution in in their outlook and they put him a communist into the leadership uh, of their local trade union uh, i think that demonstrates um you know how things change essentially um change does not happen in a slow and steady manner there's a, there can be gradual build-up of, uh, you know, quantitative changes, which suddenly, at a, at a sudden moment, leads to rapid change. And I think we should also say that there's an explicit and constant rearguard struggle by the ruling class against materialism and against dialectics or the notion that change is possible. And you see it all the time, this idea that is pumped into the brains of workers, of young people, that things are just the way they are because they are. History is just one damn thing after another. You can't really change anything. You have no control over your own life and your own destiny. This is an ideological class struggle at work from the other side. And this is why it's important as well that we arm ourselves ideologically and philosophically against religion, against all forms of conservative and idealist philosophies, because they're trying to disarm the working class um, ideologically. They're trying to strip the working class of its philosophical weapons, of its capacity and willingness to struggle. Oh, yes, exactly. I mean, we definitely don't have time to go into this in detail in this podcast. I'm sure there will be other podcasts about this, but this is exactly the role that postmodernism, identity politics, these sorts of ideas play. And bringing it back to religion and also full circle to the Marx quote that we began with, once um, people free themselves from the spiritual dictatorship which tells them that 
their lot in life is God's will, there's nothing they can do, and they'll get their reward in heaven, but not a minute before, once they're free from that, then they have the opportunity to intervene consciously in shaping their own futures. And there are many examples in history where people who were under the thrall of religion, um, you, talk, you talked about the French Revolution, obviously the Catholic Church was uh, a very powerful force, it was the biggest landlord, virtually everybody was religious, was uh, was a believer, and that changed very quickly. But also in Russia, with the Russian Revolution, you know, the, the Bolsheviks used to get beaten up by angry workers before the 1905 revolution because they were identified as atheists and slandered by the religious authorities. Um, but after the um, petition to the Tsar, led by a priest, ironically enough, Father Gapon, uh, was shot down in blood um, by armed Cossacks, the workers ran straight to the Bolsheviks and said, give us arms so that we can fight back. And it was only just over a decade later that the Bolsheviks were leading the working class to power and the the power of the Orthodox Church, its back was broken, at least in the industrial centers, at least in Petrograd. So you can see in action how the class struggle goes together with the battle against religious superstition and obscurantism, how it can free people and give them a sense of of agency for the first time over the way their life might go and over shaping their future and the future of their children. Well, yes, I think that's a, a very good example because it was, you know, even in the course of one day, you had a, a, a radical change in the outlook of the participants in that demonstration. You know, in the morning, the Bolsheviks were almost not able to give out uh, their leaflets, precisely as you say, because they were at risk of uh, of being beaten up. But then that same day, there was a change in the outlook of the participants. So that, I think, demonstrates, you know, <laughs> how a dialectical materialist approach is necessary to understand change, because, number one, it wasn't purely <laughs> the agitation of the Bolsheviks that changed people's minds, but it was um, it was the very real experience of the class struggle, <laughs> you know, physically being shot at by the, uh, you know, armed forces of the, of the Tsar. And, again, it didn't just slowly push these workers slightly in a leftward direction. They radically, even Father Gapon himself was calling for a uh, for a revolution against the Tsar that very uh, that very evening. So, how do we as communists hope to win over religious workers, religious people, um, if not using the Richard Dawkins methods of just belittling and ridiculing their beliefs, how would we connect with people for whom religion is part of their life? Yeah, well, I think this is quite a delicate question, actually, because if you think about it, well, Marxists argue that religion will only ever die out when we have a, a, a planned economy that actually meets people's needs. In order to achieve that, it needs to be the working class themselves as they exist in this actual uh, society that will achieve this. So you need to um, you need to take a yeah have a, a delicate approach basically I would say you need to avoid one of two extremes. Number one is being extremely off-putting uh, to people because it is you know as that 1905 uh, event very much illustrates for the vast majority of uh, of working class people it won't be um, our arguments in favour of atheism that, uh, you know, <laughs> um, allow them to overcome uh, their, um, you know, <laughs> religious ideas. It will be the actual involvement in the class struggle that allows them to overcome this. Um, <clears throat> so that's why, for example, uh, Engels uh, uh, argued explicitly against uh, having atheism in the political programme of the Revolutionary Party. However, the opposite mistake that you could make is to um, is to avoid dealing with the question of religion whatsoever. You know, as we've as, as we've discussed, political philosophy is an extremely important question. We can't just leave this to the side. Um, and so, you know, you mentioned uh, Engels, um, 
how importantly he held the the philosophical struggle as well. Lenin said that without revolutionary theory, you can have no revolutionary movement. The Bolsheviks never um, ignored arguing for materialism. Mm. Um, it's but it's just how you do it. So I've got uh, an an example um, at the the revolution festival. Um, that's held in Britain, we had a discussion on religion and we had a comrade who stood up and uh, she said that um, she had come from a Muslim family but she wanted to join a communist organisation because she wanted to fight against the poverty, uh, oppression, exploitation that she saw uh, in the world. And for a while, she joined a communist organisation but held on to her, um, her religious beliefs, basically. Now, the comrades who won her over didn't directly attack her. They didn't <laughs> denounce her for being a religious person. But what they did do was they discussed the difference between materialism and idealism and how uh, the utility of it in the class struggle. She also participated in the class struggle. So she was able to test out these ideas uh, in, in reality. And so after some time, she came to the conclusion for herself that she was uh, an atheist. Um, and I'd say that's the approach we need to take. We need to, a, a delicate approach that doesn't uh, put people off, but also doesn't, you know, <laughs> bury the atheism under the carpet sort of thing. Um, that's the way we can win over um, religious uh, workers. I think this is important to clarify because this is a common conception about Marxists and communists. When we come to power... Would it be our policy to simply abolish religion, to ban religion? Yes, this is uh, a common slander that is thrown at Marxists, and it's it's not true at all. But obviously, you know, it comes. There are certain uh, uh, things that are used in order to justify this approach. Now, you know, what Marxists say is that in order to end religion it's not possible to just ban it. That's <laughs> that's never going to end religion. In, in actual fact, it will just push people, uh, you know, f more in a religious direction. No, what is necessary to um, allow uh, religion to die away of its own is, number one, a, a unified class struggle. That um, You know, Marx talks about this. He says that a revolution is needed uh, to overthrow capitalism, not just to overthrow the bourgeoisie, but also to overthrow, um, I can't remember the exact quote, but to overthrow uh, all of the kind of ideological baggage that people have had through their whole upbringings. But that's not enough in and of itself. What is necessary, really, is to have a democratically planned economy, because that would be the way that you would get rid of this, uh, you know, constant uh, unemployment, uh, you know, big economic disasters, impoverishing masses of people that happens in a way that seems unexplained uh, and unexplainable. That would mean that people would no longer have need for these, uh, you know, supernatural uh, comfort. I just want to go into, uh, you know, <laughs> this uh, what is used basically um, to as evidence, so so to speak, of um, the the you know Marxist approach to religion, and that really comes from the the period of the USSR. Um, but let's go through the real um, history, basically, because what what did the Bolsheviks do and how did the policy develop over time? Well, at first, um, <clears throat> I mean, the Bolsheviks were materialists. They were Marxists. They were opponents of religion. Um, the Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church at first, was uh, big opponents of uh, the Bolsheviks as well. Uh, after the after the October Revolution, for example, the Patriarch of the Church said that the Bolsheviks were monsters of the human race, mm -hmm. uh, and the the reason for this really was not uh, some um, well. The main reason for this was that they were one of the biggest landowners and huge supporters uh, of of the Tsar. But when they came to power, what did their program say? Well, they wanted to they uh, wanted to separate the church and the state. They also gave all citizens the right to carry out propaganda, both for and against religion. So it would be an honest competition of ideas, not uh, with, you know, one side backed up by the power of the state, basically. A, a fair competition in the open marketplace of ideas, you could say. <laughs> well, no, precisely. 
Um, you you did have the the property of the church was confiscated, but as I said, they were one of the biggest landowners uh, in Russia. But church buildings were returned for the use of uh, of the clergy, um, and you had freedom of worship, meeting, everything was guaranteed basically. And at first, the church did continue to function, um, but many layers, especially the kind of youth and the those living in the cities, a lot of these people began to turn away from religion. The so more think, advanced layers, you could say. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so after taking power, um, 21 of the richest countries in the world invaded all at once. Um, they were supporting various reactionary ex-Tsarist uh, generals. And this reactionary army of, of the whites, it was called, was supported by uh, the, 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 the Orthodox Church. Um, and as part of this civil war which emerged, you did have 45 uh, members of the clergy were executed and 250 were sentenced to prison. And this is always brought up with horror, the evil, bloodthirsty Bolsheviks. The thing is, this was in the middle of a civil war. Imagine what would happen today if various generals were funded by a foreign power at the same time as 21 foreign countries simultaneously invaded Britain. I don't think the British ruling class would behave nicely. I, I saw uh, yesterday that uh, our dear old king is visiting uh, Kenya at the moment, and uh, the BBC News mentioned the Mau Mau uprising, which is an anti-colonial uprising against an occupying force. And how did the British government behave? Well, they executed 1,000 people uh, after this uprising. So I think the Bolsheviks really were pretty mild uh, in comparison. Now, Stalin and the clique around him really behaved in a very uh, bureaucratic way. Uh, when dealing with politics. They thought you could order everything from above, basically, and uh, everything would follow from that. So, for example, in 1929, all churches were forcibly closed and priests were arrested and exiled. You had the demolition of various holy sites. They even set an exact date by which religion would be abolished, which is the 1st of May 1937. Now, won't surprise anyone. That <laughs> they didn't that quite meet that deadline. <laughs> yes, no, exactly. Um, because you had, you know, as I said, the the isolation of the of the revolution meant uh, increasing uh, poverty, um, increasing suffering. Um, you didn't have things like unemployment, but you had things like uh, big famines, which were, you know, huge psychological, physical blows to people, uh, which were a product of things they <laughs> didn't control. You had a planned economy, but it wasn't a democratically planned economy by any stretch of the imagination. And what does this mean? Well, it meant over time, the material basis for religion was beginning to be strengthened. Um, and so if you fast forward a little bit, eventually you have uh, essentially a deal being struck between the uh, Stalinist bureaucracy and the church. This bureaucracy, um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a ruling class, but it was certainly a privileged elite that was monopolizing a lot of uh, wealth, power, and privileges all to itself, basically. And so it needed, much like <laughs> the, the bourgeoisie uh, needs, uh, it needed uh, certain ideas to, to secure its rule. And so it began leaning on many of the old conservative ideas from the past. And one of these was religion. So eventually, uh, you know, skipping over a little bit, but by 1943, you have an official link being formed between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Soviet state. Um, at one stage as well, the, the, the Orthodox Church, you know, they go from uh, calling the Bolsheviks animals to um, saying that Stalin was ordained by God. Um, so, but anyway, I think all of this shows that really it's more proof uh, of the of the materialist explanation of religion, essentially. Well, thank you so much, Jack. I think that uh, in the little time we have, you've quite decisively dealt with a very complicated subject and dealt with a broad sweep of history in so doing. And I hope that's cleared up for the sake of our listeners the correct communist perspective on religion a uh, product of the old world which on the basis of building the new one will wither away on its own when mankind no longer needs any sort of supernatural consolation and can finally 
pluck the living flower while we're still alive. All right, Jack, one more time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much. And we'll see you all next week. 